I don't want to yell. <laughs> Do you guys mind if I sit? No right. cares at all. Cool. My leg's a little tired. Um, so this event, we're looking at the Anglo-Cherokee War, all right? And this is a war that developed within the French and Indian War. And I'm going to stand up anyway. Um, I feel bad now. Um, so it developed within the Fr uh, French and Indian War as a result of the French and Indian War. Um, but we have to look back beyond the beginning of this war uh, to events that happened in 1747 in South Carolina. So the Cherokee Nation uh, was huge. Their lands, their territories, uh, where their towns were, extended from all the way up by Knoxville, Tennessee, down the Tennessee River, the Little Tennessee, the Nolichucky, uh, like all those rivers, all the way down uh, into the area that is now Lake Kiwi in South Carolina, where Clemson University is. Okay, this is a huge territory, but that's just where their towns are. Their hunting lands and lands that they essentially control extend even further. Um, in South Carolina, these lands went all the way down to almost Columbia, which is a long way, right? <laughs> Their land extended northwards all the way up into Kentucky. The land extended eastwards almost to here. Um, more towards the beyond North Wilkesboro line there. Um, so this is a huge amount of territory, right? In 1747, because there's a lot of colonists moving into South Carolina, and there is no official boundary, South Carolina approached the Cherokee to set a boundary, and they picked the Long Canes Creek. It is down, does anybody know where Abbeville, South Carolina is? Um, it is south of Greenville, um, south and east of Greenville, and it's this line that they go, okay, this is going to be our boundary, but nobody ever surveyed it. They kind of made an arbitrary, this is our boundary. Don't go there, don't go beyond there. And in the early 1750s, just a couple years after, a few people start to trickle in and they're finding this land that is beautifully cultivated and it's perfect for hunting because for thousands of years, Native Americans had been cultivating this land for hunting. And these settlers here coming in going, Wow, this place is perfect for farming, for hunting. It's awesome. It's the best place you could possibly live. So they start settling there. And the Cherokee are like, what are you guys doing? This is our hunting land. We didn't give you permission to live here. We gave you permission to use the land. Their idea of what they have done with South Carolina is that they're giving land use rights, not the territory itself to call the, our own, right? So there's a very big cultural misunderstanding going on here. And apologize, uh, I have notes that I have to use. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to cover. Um, so in 1754, the war break, breaks out. And everybody knows who started the French and Indian War, right? Who? What? Very good, George Washington. It wasn't the French, it wasn't Native Americans. George Washington ambushed a group of, Fr of French soldiers um, up in Pennsylvania who were actually sent on a diplomatic mission. And when diplomats get killed, things go south very rapidly, and it led to a world war. By 1756, it has actually become a world war, but there is fighting happening all the way from Nova Scotia down into what is today South Carolina. And the Cherokee, like the Catawba, who still have a reservation down by Charlotte, uh, the Cherokee are English allies. They were actually economically tied at the hip because they, the Cherokee are making hand over fist cash money uh, in trade goods through hunting. Charleston was founded to capitalize on the deerskin trade. And this is a very... Uh, amazingly perfect relationship and of course you're going to support your economic ties when it comes to war. So the Cherokee say yeah we'll help and in 1756 
because French allied Native Americans are devastating Virginia and they're devastating parts of North Carolina and into South Carolina, the Cherokee and Virginia hatch a plan that they are going to make a strike on Shawnee towns. And they're going to join the Virginia Regiment and a group of Cherokee are going to create a joint expedition in the winter following the Sandy Creek, which is the Tug River, the border of Kentucky and West Virginia. And they make it like a week and a half and everybody starts dying of starvation. Uh, they're eating their horses, people are drowning in the river, they're freezing to death. And the Cherokee the whole time are going, man, you guys are idiots, right? And so they abandon it, but they turn around at the end of this and they go, okay, you guys need to learn how to fight in the woods. We will train you, but we're going to train the men we want to train, and it's going to be on our terms. And the Cherokees start sending warriors to uh, Virginia and even up into Maryland throughout 1756 and 57. And they take guys, soldiers, provincials mostly, and train them. They're teaching them how to go to war native style. And at the same time that that's happening, as the Cherokee warriors are traveling north to Virginia and Maryland, in South Carolina, more and more settlers continue to funnel into the Long Canes area. And there's nobody that notices because all the warriors are up north. People start funneling in. And a th an incident happens in uh, 1757. Some of those settlers murdered two Cherokee men and two Cherokee women. When they were questioned about it, they blamed it on the Chickasaw, the Catawba, the Shawnee, enslaved people, everybody that's not white, right? And then an enslaved guy goes, yeah, I actually saw it happen. These are the people that did it. And South, Car South Carolina kind of goes, eh, okay. And they do nothing about it. In 1758, there's an expedition going on up in Pennsylvania, or is starting, called the Forbes Campaign, and it's a campaign from with the British Army provincial soldiers to attack Fort Duquesne, a French fort that stood in what's today downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The Cherokee agreed to send warriors to help Pennsylvania, or to help the British Army, and they send almost 700 warriors to Pennsylvania. At the same time, more than a thousand Cherokee warriors in different war parties go west and start attacking French positions all along the Mississippi River, almost from New Orleans to the Great Lakes. They're devastating the, the French. And they're doing this in spite of the fact that this stuff is going on down in South Carolina. But there's a problem. Native Americans have a justice system that's a little different than ours. When a Native person is murdered, the warriors of their community must go to the people that killed their friend or loved one and take a life for life. While one of these war parties, Pennsylvania, they came from the town that the people were murdered from, and so the Cherokee people were murdered from, okay? And on their way to Pennsylvania, they killed two people in Virginia. It's justice. That's all it is. The Cherokee go, okay, cool. We'll call it even. We're good again. That's in March of 1758. In May, there was a group of Cherokee traveling south going home, and Virginians murdered uh, three of them, took two of them prisoner. And of course, this irritates the Cherokee greatly. Um, in June, because the campaign in Pennsylvania is going very badly, the British commander keeps trying to treat the Cherokee not as allies, but as his own soldiers, as if they were enlisted in his army. And they're not delivering on the things they promised, their supplies, which the British army, in fairness, was having a hard time putting clothes on their own soldiers' back. But. So the Cherokees start flooding home, and they're just like, forget these guys, we're done. Throughout, um, from June to September, they're kind of just trickling in. In September, on Goose Creek, 
which is just north of Roanoke, Virginia, the local militia started ambushing Cherokee groups heading south, heading home. And they were killing people almost every day, ambushing Cherokee and murdering them. And it happens for about two weeks. They just keep hitting Cherokee men traveling south who had just spent their time in Pennsylvania 600 miles from home fighting to defend these people. Three of the Cherokee were war chiefs and they were hunted down and their bodies were dismembered and hung by the side of a road. That made the Cherokee extremely mad. The Cherokee get back to South Carolina and they go to the commander of a fort called Fort Prince George and they go, this is what happened in Virginia, we need justice. And the guys at the fort go, why didn't you tell the guys in Virginia? You should have done it. So, pardon me for just a second, find it, uh, they also at the same time this is happening, they, the warriors from the lower towns get home to find tons and tons of settlers in their hunting grounds, and September is hunting season for the winter, and all of the deer are gone. They've been driven off because there's so many people living down there, and the Cherokee get really angry at that point. You've got Cherokee being murdered by their allies in Virginia. They now can't provide for their families in South Carolina and you're looking at a winter of starvation. In April and May of 1759, the Cherokee were so fed up that they turned around and they attacked and took the lives of about 40 settlers. Most of them were along the Catawba River in the settlement right here, within 10 miles of us, and along the Yadkin River all the way out by Winston-Salem. They kill the same number of people as Cherokee were murdered. It's justice, right? And the Cherokee at that point go, okay, we're good. We're the allies again. And they start attacking the French all over again. And they're bringing back French prisoners and French scalps and giving them to the colonial governments down in, uh, particularly down at the fort that they complained at, Fort Prince George. In July of 1759, just a few months after these murders, at Fort Prince George, some of the officers raped Cherokee women. One of them was the wife of a war chief named Sarawet. He was one of the principal warriors that uh, went to fight in Pennsylvania for the British. He was a super big champion of the British. And his wife was raped by soldiers from South Carolina. He goes on the war path. But before he did, he went to Georgia and asked Georgia to help him deal with the stuff that's going on at Fort Prince George. And Georgia goes, yeah, they said nothing happened, so sorry. You should go to talk to the governor. And the governor won't hear it. Sarawa goes at the end of September. He goes on the war path. And he gets recalled. Uh, one of the Cherokee chiefs out of Bula Bula managed to get a hold of him and said, dude, we're gonna, we're gonna take care of this. We're gonna take care of it. We'll deal with this. Come back in, don't attack the whites. And he did, he came back in. They gave, he gave him time, he said, okay, I'll give you an, a certain amount of time. If it's not taken care of though, we're, we're killing everybody. And everything keeps continuously escalating. Also in September, because it's becoming much, much more hostile, 38 Cherokee chiefs went to Charleston to meet with the governor, and they're trying to get this thing organized, or, se or settled, excuse me. They're trying to get everything calmed down. The governor took them hostage. He demanded that the Cherokee turn over all of the warriors that attacked North Carolina in April and May at least 80 so they could be executed. Why did the Cherokee attack North Carolina? It's for justice because all the Cherokee getting murdered in Virginia and South Carolina. 
the governor takes the hostages back to Fort Prince George, throws them in jail cells, and tells the Cherokee, you give me a, a, a murderer, um, I'll give you a hostage. The Cherokee turn over nine murderers. The governor released two hostages. Then the other uh, people are allowed to come in and see the, the men being held hostage, and they find out that smallpox is running rampant and that these hostages are actually dying and sick, and they're living in horrific conditions. And the Cherokee get really angry. On February 1st, they attacked the Long Cane settlers. There was a wagon train of people fleeing, and they descended on the Long Cane settlement and killed 50 men, women, and children. <coughs> and they started attacking everywhere after that on the frontier. It really escalated after the soldiers at Fort Prince George murdered the remaining hostages. And the Cherokee started attacking as far north as what is today Mount Airy, all the way to the east side of what is today Winston-Salem, all the way down the Catawba River Valley, throughout South Carolina. They were attacking as far east as the east side of Columbia. They were 80 miles from Charleston, and the entire frontier emptied because people were fleeing. And they were even attacking in northern Georgia. That's how the war started. And it ended after the British sent two expeditions to South Carolina to deal with the Cherokee. The first expedition was commanded by a guy named Archibald Montgomery. He had 1,200 soldiers and he was given the task of getting the Cherokee to stop attacking the frontier. The Cherokee had laid siege to a fort South Carolina built near Knoxville. He had to relieve that siege and he had to get the Cherokee to sign a peace treaty. And he was given orders to burn Cherokee town to get him to come in and talk peace. Along his way west, Montgomery started figuring out that the Cherokee really weren't the bad guys here. He ordered his soldiers to burn towns. They burned 10 Cherokee towns, but he also ordered them to not murder anyone. Murder of a man, woman, or child, a Cherokee man, woman, or child, would be punishable by death. And there are no reports that they murdered a single Cherokee. There were a couple skirmishes, and warriors were kill killed in combat, but that was it. When Montgomery took those prisoners, he brought them back to Fort Prince George, and he treated them really, really well. His job is to get the Cherokee to sign a peace treaty and become allies again. He wanted his friends back. The, the Cherokee prisoners were fed the same rations as the soldiers. They were clothed. And Montgomery then released some of the prisoners. He said, go tell your countrymen you're not dealing with South Carolina anymore. You're dealing with me and I want my friends back. But what had happened at Fort Prince George in the beginning of the year. The soldiers murdered the last peace delegates. So the Cherokee are like, no, this is a trap. Montgomery decided he needed to march deeper into Cherokee territory. We're going to burn more towns, and we're going to reach Fort Loudoun, the fort near Knoxville, relieve the siege, and this will bring the Cherokee to sign a peace treaty. The Cherokee defeated Montgomery just three miles south of Franklin, North Carolina, in a big battle. Those soldiers fought 80 miles through the mountains in three days. Following this major victory, the Cherokee went right back to attacking the frontier. They captured that fort near, in, near Knoxville. And so the British sent a second army to South Carolina early in 1761. The commander of that army, as he marched his troops west, he started sending letters to his boss, Lord Jeffrey Amherst in New York City, the one that dispatched him. One of his letters, which they all had the same tone, one of the letters, one of the first ones said, were the Cherokee given a voice, we would learn uh, that they are not so much to blame as our colonies, colonists, settlers, something like that. <laughs> He's saying we're punishing the wrong people. It's, the, it's our, it's our provinces that did this, not the Cherokee. And Amherst sent him letters back that basically said, shut up and follow your orders. 
So he marched his army west. They defeated the Cherokee in a big battle just uh, about three miles south of Franklin on the 10th of June, 1761, and they spent the following month burning 18 additional Cherokee towns. They destroyed more than 800 multifamily homes, every single bit of food that was stored, and more than 1,500 acres of crops. Francis Marion, very famous Revolutionary War uh, re rebel, he wrote a letter in the Charleston Gazette, and one of the lines said, when we put torch to corn, we wept. They burned the homes and food of more than 5,000 men, women, and children. And at the same time that was happening, North Carolina and Virginia had another army in what is today Kingsport, Tennessee, and it was getting ready to invade and do the same thing to the rest of the Cherokee Nation. So that brought them to their knees. Before that second invasion even launched, the Cherokee big gave up. They ended up having to cede thousands, thousands of acres of land. They were faced with arms embargoes, hunting embargoes. They couldn't provide for themselves. The commander of the British Army that did all the burning, though, he bucked the, his boss, and he bucked South Carolina. He started shipping food to the Cherokee and trying to save them. South Carolina went for his jugular. They wanted him uh, brought up on charges for treason. Uh, they tried to destroy him. Luckily, he actually went on for an, to uh, have an illustrious career for him. Lucky for him. Um, and of course, he did manage to preserve the Cherokee, though hundreds and hundreds died of starvation and exposure. But the nation was at least, I guess, not wiped off the face of the earth like South Carolina wanted. So, that's a lot of information. It's a lot. Um, it's a lot to digest. Um, do you guys have questions?